This is part two of a two-part series. If you missed part one last week, you might want to catch up before you go further. As you might recall us saying last time, back in our grade school summer vacation library reading program days, we read a lot of books. And among the many types and genres of books we read were stories of the early days of the United States of America and its struggle to survive and flourish. Chief among these stories were tales of heroism and determination that featured heroic men and women pushing back the boundaries of the nation or fighting in its defense. And, as we pointed out, while these tall tales and folklore were all well and good and played an important role in defining what the nation valued and how its people were to contribute, they also served to turn very real people into caricatures of themselves. Sometimes they would hide or ignore facts about the people involved that were inconvenient or unpleasant. Other times they served to blur multiple real people into a character meant to stand for all, making it impossible for future generations to properly acknowledge and understand those who sacrificed so much to keep the nation moving forward. But that was just one type of tall tale, the kind based around a known individual who takes on an almost legendary status. This week, we're asking about tall tales based on individuals who are made up, who start out as fictional people that never really existed in the first place. Take the story of Joe Magarak as an example. They say Joe was born in an iron mine and raised in a furnace. He was seven feet tall and literally made of steel. His shoulders were so broad he'd have to turn sideways to get through the door of the Pittsburgh steel mill where he lived and worked. He ate cold steel for breakfast and drank a gallon of hot steel every lunchtime. And he was the greatest steel worker who ever lived. He did the work of 30 normal men, never slept and never quit working. 24-7, 365, he stirred hot vats of steel with his bucket-sized bare hands, twisted steel ingots into horseshoes, and squeezed molten steel between his fingers to make rails for the railroad. He was unstoppable, and he always watched over the safety of his work crews. When a 50-ton ladle full of molten steel threatened to break loose and pour over his men, Joe jumped from furnace rim to furnace rim across the mill and caught the bucket with his bare hands, spilling not a drop on the workers below. Magarak even stopped a runaway downhill train full of steel ingots by grabbing the last car and hauling the whole train back uphill saving all the men at the bottom from disaster. But Joe knew that some things were more important than himself. When Pittsburgh needed a new mill to churn out steel for new bridges and keep the country moving, they didn't have enough steel to spare. So Joe made the big sacrifice and melted himself down so they could finish the job. You can see in the story of Joe Magarak, all the important things you'd want to tell your average steelworker. Work hard, look out for your fellow's safety, and give it everything you've got because your nation needs you. It's growing and you can help it. And around the turn of the 20th century, these are exactly the sorts of stories you need to tell the workers of an industry that will be helping to build the infrastructure of the nation. Which is what makes Joe Magarak's story so interesting it didn't exist before 1931. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. In 1931, Owen Francis wrote an article for Scribner's Magazine based on what he said were stories from Croatian immigrants working in the Pittsburgh area steel mills. According to Francis, these stories about Joe Magarak had been told around steel mills since at least the late 1800s, passed on by oral tradition from one worker to the next. Subsequent research by folklorists in the 1950s, though, failed to turn up any evidence of the tales. To make matters worse, if Francis did hear the story from Croatians, they certainly never told him that Magarak was basically Croatian for jackass. He did notice that they tended to laugh a lot among themselves whenever they told him the stories, though. If his story were true, it sure seemed like someone had been deliberately pulling his leg. More than likely, though, Joe Magrak is the product of what some folklorists call fake lore or pseudo-folklore. The term encompasses new stories and songs that are made up 
but presented as if they were in fact traditional, as well as actual folklore reworked and modified for modern tastes. The misrepresentation of these stories as if they were authentic is the key element. It's one thing to come up with a new story in the style of traditional folklore, but an entirely different thing to pretend it is actually authentic folklore. Sometimes, stories that start out as fake lore can become actual folklore, and some stories that start out as folklore can become fake lore and then become folklore once again. Paul Bunyan is a hard one to categorize. Some scholars maintain that Bunyan came out of several stories told around lumber campfires based on early exploits of Canadian lumberjacks in the mid to late 1800s. Fabian Forney, sometimes called Saginaw Joe, is often held up as one source. He was born about 1845 in Quebec, was six feet tall and reportedly pretty strong. After the American Civil War, Forney moved to Michigan to take advantage of a growing timber industry. He was rough and rowdy, and after he met an untimely death in Bay City, Michigan, stories about Saginaw Joe began circulating in the lumber camps. But that's just one Canadian lumberjack. Another possible model for Paul is someone called Paul Bonjean, whose exploits are largely unrecorded beyond the fact that he fought in the Papineau Rebellion in 1837 in Canada. The thinking seems to be that due to the way his name is pronounced, Bonjean, it eventually morphed into Banyan. Whatever stories there were got mingled with Saginaw Joe's stories, and then all the lumberjacks just sort of agreed that there was this Paul Bunyan guy who did some amusing stuff, and why not let's tell stories about him. Honestly, it's pretty weak evidence and there's a lot against it, not the least of which is the timing. Paul Bunyan's exploits are already being told around Wisconsin campfires before Saginaw Joe's story even makes it that far. It feels a lot like everyone is just sort of grasping at whatever straw they can find to give Paul Bunyan an authentic sounding provenance. By the mid-1880s, stories about Bunyan are told wherever lumberjacks and timber workers gathered. And because lumberjacks moved from camp to camp in search of work, it didn't take long for the stories to spread across most of the country. It seems extremely likely that most of the stories were of the one time I heard about this guy variety, where instead of being vague recollections about forgotten individuals, those individuals all became Paul Bunyan, either to lend some form of authenticity or to fit them in with an existing tradition. Eventually, the stories begin to reach beyond the lumber camps, and outsiders start to take notice. As the stories got more and more outlandish, they became more of a general entertainment rather than a way to pass the evening in the bunkhouse. It's into this sort of proto-folklore environment that an unnamed writer steps in 1904 when the Duluth News Tribune publishes the first known story of Bunyan to appear in print. Two years later, the Escota Press prints a series of Bunyan anecdotes written by former lumberjack James McGilvray, which he would then go on to reprint in the Detroit News in 1910. And from there, things took off of their own accord. Numerous papers and editors reprinted and added to the stories McGilvray had already written. Through these stories, much of the foundational elements of Paul Bunyan are laid. His prodigious strength, exceptional height, elements of his logging camps, and the fact that he was often accompanied by a large ox all appear in the first few stories printed. Although, sometimes the ox is pink instead of blue. Along about 1916, the Red River Lumber Company wanted to advertise their services and turned to freelance writer William B. Loffitt to make it happen. Loffitt in turn produced a promotional pamphlet for Red River that reworked many of the existing Paul Bunyan tales, both oral and in print, and added some of his own. In the Red River pamphlet, Paul's attributes were greatly exaggerated. He became taller than the trees themselves, and his exploits similarly scaled in size until Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox were responsible not just for some good yarns to tell around the fire, but for features of the American landscape and parts of its history. Paul becomes so entangled that some stories recount his exploits in the Revolutionary War, while others explain that Paul and Babe's footprints are the reason Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, Oregon's Mount Hood is a pile of rocks Paul used to make a campfire, and the Grand Canyon is an accidental ditch Paul made when he lazily dragged the edge of his axe behind him. From there on, it's open season on Paul Bunyan stories as numerous writers begin publishing books about the mythical figure. And then, and what's bound to sound familiar if you heard part one of this little series, in 
Disney got hold of the character in 1958 and produced the animated musical short Paul Bunyan, featuring a selection of the most popular stories about the gigantic lumberjack. It wouldn't be the only film they did which featured him, but it was the first and most significant. It's this phase of the Paul Bunyan story that is sometimes called fake lore by folklorists. Basically, everything written or filmed about Bunyan from the 1904 story in the Duluth News Tribune onward is fabricated from whole cloth with little to no basis in the actual stories that were really told in lumber camps of the day. In the original stories, according to some folklorists, the language used was so highly specific to the work of lumberjacks of the day that outsiders would have had a hard time even understanding many of the words used. As with any industry, they related so tightly to the work and tools in use that anyone without any experience of them would have been left in the cold. Furthermore, the point is made that while Paul may have been large for his day, in the original stories he was rarely more than at the extreme of normal human height, about seven feet at the outside, and his strength, while impressive, was about what a hard-working, fit, normal person would exhibit. Basically, the argument goes everything we think we know about Paul Bunyan now is a product of the fictional stories and films that cropped up after the turn of the century, and not the authentic folklore of 30 years prior. However, as John Olson points out in his 1976 volume entitled Western Folklore, dismissing the commercialized tales of Paul Bunyan as fake lore is too easy. For some, these films will stand as an excellent example of skillfully packaged fake lore. For others, including myself, they are good stories aimed at young people in a medium they understand, animated film. They are examples of the ongoing interaction of commercial mythmaking and the American archetypal themes that strike a responsive chord in the larger society. Despite the lack of pedigree for these tales, the understanding of the process of their acceptance, especially when incorporated into oral tradition, is a worthy goal. The point being that because these commercial stories have become part of the Paul Bunyan mythos, they are now some of the stories told orally, and in that regard have cycled back into becoming authentic folklore, because they still reflect the character of the people and places they are about, and resonate with the people they are being told to. And it's not just Paul Bunyan this happens to, though he is perhaps the most complicated example. Some heroes of folklore never even existed as tall tales in the first place, having been deliberately created to capitalize on the public's growing fascination with such stories in the early 1900s. Paul Bunyan has any number of shirt tail relatives or associates that are claimed by numerous locations around the country. Cordwood Pete is, according to the stories, Paul Bunyan's less impressive normal-sized brother who, because of his lesser stature, grew tired of being mocked and went off to make his way in the world with a chip on his shoulder. A ferocious fighter and easily angered, he eventually made his way to Faustin, Minnesota and hooked up with his brother's logging camp. There, on one memorable occasion, he stole his brother's double-bladed axe and swung it so hard that it kept him spinning around and around until he had chopped down an entire forest from one swing. The entire life story of Cordwood Pete comes to us thanks to the discovery of a time capsule in 2001 in Faustin, which was probably put in place by a former mayor of Faustin, Arvid Clemenson. Similarly, Tony Beaver is a champion griddle skater and cousin to Paul Bunyan, and we personally know of yet another of Paul's relatives, another little brother named Ralph Bunyan, whose wooden statue stands in the city park of Butte Falls, Oregon carved by one of our relatives years ago. World-famous Texan Pecos Bill is another fake lore creation. Created in 1917 by Edward O'Reilly for the Century Magazine and then reprinted in 1923 in the Saga of Pecos Bill, the tales told the story of a baby accidentally abandoned by a family making their way across the American Southwest by covered wagon. Baby Bill was found by coyotes and raised as one of their own until one day by the Pecos River, Bill happened upon another human being who took him in and taught him to be a real cowboy. Bill then proceeds to ride his horse Widowmaker all around the Southwest, having all sorts of adventures, including making the Rio Grande to water his cattle, creating the Lone Star symbol for Texas by shooting all the stars save one from the sky, and inventing most of the things you'd associate with a cowboy today, like the lasso, spurs, and the six-shooter. One of our early favorites in the tall tale genre came out of New England. 
It told the tale of Captain Stormalong, a sailor of unparalleled proficiency. As a baby, he washed up on the shores of Massachusetts in the early 1800s and was already three fathoms tall. He grew rapidly and eventually set off to the harbors of Boston, where he signed aboard ship as a cabin boy at age 12. He was made to stand watch since he was so tall, being naturally able to see further than anyone else, and in this way he learned to sail and run a ship. One day he decided he wanted a ship of his own, one scaled to his own size so as to be more convenient for him. He looked for a long, long time until he found a man willing to build a ship for now a 30 foot tall, fully grown man such as Stormalong. When he finally found the man to do it, Captain Stormalong commissioned the clipper ship Corsair and the man set about building it. It took so much wood to build that the shipwright, whose name was Dingy Drawknife, had to scramble to find enough wood to complete the hull. Fortunately, he knew a man who had worked in Paul Bunyan's logging camp a season or two before and sent word out. Soon, more than enough timber was delivered and the courser was launched on time, a miracle in itself, at noon on the appointed day. And mighty proud of her was Captain Stormalong, as he gave her a shakedown cruise around Boston Harbor for a few hours until, along about supper time, he tried to sail out of the harbor. The harder he pushed the courser east, the more her nose rose out of the water, and the harder it was to keep her headed in the right direction. To make matters worse, the cargo kept trying to slide aft, taking the crew with it. They were nearly on the point of tipping over backward when one of the ship's crew, who'd been away up in the rigging, finally made it to the deck, and as he was sliding by storm along on the tilt, managed to shout out, The sun, Captain! We're hung on the sun! Old Stormalong looked up, and sure enough, as the day passed and the sun sank lower in the sky, the great masts of the courser had chanced to catch the lip of the sun, hanging up the top of the ship while the bottom kept trying to go forward. So embarrassed was Stormalong by having to paddle the ship backward himself to get her loose that he had Dingy Drawknife install hinges on all the masts so she could clear the sun and the moon when she needed to. Captain Stormalong would go on to have many adventures. He was mortal enemies with the Kraken. He once ran aground so hard he cut the Panama Canal by accident, and the ship was so big it got stuck in the English Channel and had to be greased out, which is why the formerly Great Cliffs of Dover are now the White Cliffs of Dover. He sailed all seven seas and took great pleasure in dumping buckets of water down the stack of steamships. In general, he was just a lot of fun to read about. The first tall tales about Stormalong appeared in books from the 1930s, and though he's not as well recognized these days, he still enjoys some popularity in his native New England. Not all tall tales revolve around mythical men and women, though. Some deal with the dangers of their environments as well. Particularly full of dangers were the very same logging camps that produced the stories of Paul Bunyan. Lumberjacks would be out in what was essentially the wilds of America trying to do a job that was already inherently dangerous in an environment that only made things harder. At any time, something could go wrong, and you'd be miles from the nearest help. Any mistakes may well be fatal. As with various fairy tales, the tall tale was a way to pass on a warning that was far more likely to stick with you wrapped as it was in an amusing story than it would if someone just walked up to you and said, hey, watch out for falling branches, they might kill you. Because everyone knew that, really, it was the Argo Pelter that would kill you. According to 1910's Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods by William T. Cox, and the later Fearsome Critters by Henry H. Tryon, the Argo Pelter lived in the tops of trees and enjoyed the often bad, rotten, and punky wood found there. If you were a lumberjack unlucky enough to venture into the territory of the long-armed quadruped, an angry Argo Pelter would snap off full-grown limbs and hurl them down upon the heads of unwary travelers. You'd best keep your hat on and pay attention. They aren't nicknamed the Widowmaker for no reason. But not every critter of the Lumberwoods is a warning in disguise. Some are merely there as an alternate explanation to wearisome questions from the inexperienced. Most loggers would, by the 20th or 30th time, get tired of explaining why some trees are mere snapped-off stumps. Bored with explaining freezing weather or storms or what have you, it seems quite reasonable that they would come up with the splinter cat 
a large feline that enjoys eating bees and raccoons, but that is so dumb it hunts them by flinging itself headfirst at their nests inside hollow trees, both knocking itself out and giving the prey time to escape, and also snapping the target tree off short. And at least then the old guys get a laugh at the new guy's expense. Now naturally, you're immune to this sort of thing. You'll be wise to things like the side hill gouger, an animal uniquely suited to go around hills and mountains in one direction only, thanks to a stunted pair of legs on the uphill side. The fur-bearing trout, a fish that has evolved to survive in cold and frozen waters by growing a thick coat of fur. And the hoop snake, that makes good speed by taking its tail in its mouth and rolling itself along the trail. It's likely that you'll be wise to the jackalope, and you've probably never once been out to hunt snipe in the dark of a moonless night, bag in hand, while your friends run off into the woods to chase one towards you. The tall tale has a legitimate place in the history of the United States, both as fictional characters meant to embody the values of the communities in which they are created, and as a semi-historically based account of actual people who made significant contributions to the growth of the nation, despite their many flaws. Over time, they helped unify a nation around a similar set of principles and ideals that helped solidify the national identity of the United States. What's important is not that the story be entirely true and factual in all respects, but rather that the ideas and values being shared are true and factual. We value hard work, individualism, a strong work ethic, and more as part of who we are as Americans, just as other countries have their own identities which they too value. And like us, they too share those values from generation to generation through their own folklore and tall tales, each of us building towards our own ideals. If you want to understand how a country sees itself, start with its folklore. You've been listening to the GM Word of the Week podcast. Thanks for taking the time to rate and review us and tell your friends about us last week. We're happy to say that you helped a family of listeners to grow. And thanks Scandinavia for being cool enough to say hello back. That's pretty neat. For those of you who missed the news at the first of last month, or who are just now getting caught up, we're a one-person operation now. The angry GM, Scott, had a lot of his own projects on his plate that he wasn't making much headway on. That, in combination with writing our episodes for the better part of six years, led him to refocus his efforts on his own projects. So he handed things off to me, Brian. Hopefully you've enjoyed listening to the new episodes as much as I've enjoyed writing them. I know they're different than they used to be, but I hope you like them nonetheless. I'm really proud of them. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the show or help support the show, you can do so by going to gmwordoftheweek.com. The hamburger menu there has all the links you need to get in touch, subscribe to the show, or offer support. It's not a real hamburger. It just sort of looks like one if you squint a bit. GM Word of the Week is written, researched, and produced by Brian Casey via a method that involves frequent distractions and tea. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Just because it's a tall tale, don't mean it ain't true.